Shabbat Shalom to all of you, dear beloved brothers and sisters, who have joined me before the presence of the Lord to hear his word. May the word of God bless you abundantly. The name of our talk today is Preparing Our Hearts. And before we start with the scriptures, let us pray. Bowing our heads before the Lord. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we bow in our hearts before your holy presence. We make our hearts open before you and humbly pray that your Holy Spirit with your fire we look into our hearts and that you will grant us the grace that we need, O oh God, to face whatsoever you are showing us, Lord, that we may be able to be ready for these times that are so near us, dear Lord. Therefore, let our hearts be open to your word, our ears, to hear what your spirit is saying, and our eyes to see what your Holy Spirit is doing. Lord, let every word that comes out of the mouth of your servant never return void to you but it will accomplish that which you send it forth for, that you may be glorified and that your name be exalted in the heart of all the hearers and in the hearts of all the people of the earth. As your word goes forth, let your name be glorified. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, as I was seeking the Lord for, for this time of sharing together his word, the Lord brought me to Jeremiah 29 verse 11. And that scripture says, So I know my thoughts and my plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for good and not for evil, to help you in your final outcome. So really, this word has been such an encouragement to me, particularly when we go through circumstances that are not pleasant, they are not expected. And uh, of course, this, the enemy and the world will tell you something is failed. Something is wrong, but God is never wrong and God never fails. He says he'll never leave us. He says he'll never forsake us. And he says that he thoughts, he plans for us in his heart are for good and not for evil. So it is not God who intends evil. It is not God's heart who desires evil. On the contrary, he will do anything even as far as judging us that we may finally or at the final outcome have hope, the hope of our salvation. This is the heart of God for all humanity. And then the Lord led me to Jeremiah 4 verse 12. And he says this, and I was amazed to read this. And he says, a wind too strong, a full of winnowing comes at my word. Now I will also speak in judgment against my people. What is the Lord saying? That he will send a strong wind, too strong and in judgment? Is anybody hearing? 
Is anybody taking note? This is what God is saying. He's saying he's sending a strong winds, too strong in judgment against his people. Well, dear beloved, have you heard about the strong winds that have been blowing lately? Take note. Look at what's happening in the world right now and in such parts of the body of Christ. What is going on today? Then we can read in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 14. God says this to Jerusalem, and I believe to every believer as well. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your iniquous and grossly offensive thoughts lodge within you? The real issues of the heart, isn't it? Dear beloved, there are consequences for harboring evil thoughts in our hearts, such as unforgiveness, resentment, selfish, slanders, accusation, accusation accusations, gossip in the hearts doesn't even have to come out through our mouths. God is talking of the heart and the heart can bring us to consequences such as the ones that are spoken in the book of Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 18 where he says your ways and your doings have brought these things upon you. This is your calamity and doom. Surely it's bitter, for surely it reaches your very heart. Well, just in case anybody thinks that it is just for Israel, this is also a message for us, for we are grafted in the olive tree, as it is spoken in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, 17. Let's look at it. But if some of the branches were broken off, meaning the Jews, while you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among them to share the riches of the root and sap, of the olive tree, isn't that so? And in Romans 11 verse 21 says, For if God did not spare the natural branches because of unbelief, remember this word, because of unbelief, neither will he spare you if you are guilty of the same offense. So God is very mindful that his people who call themselves believers, who call themselves Christians because they are meant to be Christ-like or manifest the Christ in their life. He's saying he will not spare those that practice and believe However, the good news is that whether Jews or Gentiles, should we repent of our ways for as long as we have breath to breed, God is more than gracious and righteous to forgive us all. However, we cannot manipulate God. He knows. We cannot say I will sin until my last breath because today he might call you. Today might be your last breath. Today you may be caught 
in sin. We sin in the heart. You see, the issue is in the heart. Because first it has to happen in our heart before it happens elsewhere. Doesn't the word of God say, did the Lord not say that a man commits adultery or fornication or, 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 or sexual immorality in the thoughts? It's counted as sin when it's happening in the thoughts. <coughs> so, the issues of the heart. In verse 23 of Romans chapter 11, God says this, and even those others, the fallen branches, the Jews, if they do not persist in clinging to their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them again. So if God is willing to graft the Jews back into the original olive tree after they repent for unbelief, which I am sure it will happen because the Bible says so, how much more? Those Gentiles that have come to know their Savior, when they repent, they will be brought back into the family. But it's important, dear beloved, that we check our faith. We may ask ourselves, in these very slow times, are we really willing to believe God and his promises while we are surrounded by terror, by crime, by lies, deception, and all sorts of evil manifesting? Are we ready? Are we willing? Well, beloved, even such is the love of God that he always gives us a way and a door of escape from temptation. And so if we find in our hearts today, if the Spirit of the Lord is showing any one of us today a certain level of unwillingness to trust in God while things are not doing well or not seem to be doing well, when things are not going according to what we want them to be, when things are troublesome, when there is persecution, if we find in our heart a certain degree of unbelief, a certain degree of fear and trembling, a certain degree of frightening, and not really 100% trusting the promises of God. It could be for two things. One, that we don't know the promises of God. Two, we don't have the revelation of a, a, a personal relationship with God. And therefore, how can we trust him? We don't know him. How can we trust his promises? We don't know them. If this is the case for some of the believers, the door is given for us, first of all, to remember we are in the last time and we need to prepare our hearts if we want to enjoy the glory of God in these last days while there is doom and darkness all around us. God is allowing us to humble ourselves and pray and repent and ask our loving Heavenly Father to help us. We can ask the Holy Spirit to help us to make a decision because it's a matter of the will, the heart and the will. 
And God says in his word, he's the sovereign God that works in our hearts to will and to do what is his good pleasure. So let us ask him that that scriptures be fulfilled in our hearts. That we may be willing to put time aside to die to self and all other things that we may be able to build a relationship, a friendship with the Lord, a friendship with his word, a friendship with his Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit begin to reveal with his fire Christ in us, who God is in us. And who are we in God? So today, when we finish the scriptures, don't just go away and continue business as usual. Spend a little time on your knees and cry out to the Lord for help. All of us need more of him. Even if we have wonderful fellowship, wouldn't we want more of him? Let us remember, dear beloved ones, as we behold what's going on around the world, that we are in the last days and we can expect troubles, wars, persecution, natural disasters, famine, and all kinds of evil manifestations in our midst. I recommend you read Matthew 24. Now, more than ever before, dear beloved, it is important for us to be prepared. There are many ways to be prepared for this end time. But today we are going to talk about the preparation of the heart. Because I believe that's great importance that our heart may be ready to meet the Lord. Our heart may be ready to meet the circumstances. And all the troubles that are going to happen and will continue increasing in this world. The heart must be made ready that may not faint when we behold everything around us as troublesome and terror. And we must prepare our hearts to be so tenderly in love and close to God that nothing in this world will be able to separate us. That neither fear nor worries will take home in us. The Word of God tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, like this, but understand this, that in the last days will come perilous times of great stress and troubles, hard to deal and hard to bear. So, beloved ones, we are warned. Are we taking notes? Or we just hear it and then business as usual. We must be prepared. Without being ready, we will caught, we be caught unawares. And it's possible that our hearts will faint because our life is not founded in the love of Christ and the fellowship with his spirit. All around us, can we see what's happening, what's going on? Hear this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 to 4. It says, for people will be lovers of self, mm. self-centered, mm -hmm. lovers of money, and aroused by my inordinate desire for wealth, mm -hmm. proud and arrogant, 
contemptuous boasters? They will be abusive and blasphemous and scoffing, disobedient to parent, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. Does this ring a bell? Verse 3. They will be without natural human affection. Uh -huh. Callous and inhuman. Relentless. Admitting no appeasement. They will be slanderers. False accusers. Troublemakers intemperate and loose in moral conduct. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me, uncontrolled and fierce, haters of what is good. Does this in any way sound familiar? Verse 4. They will be treacherous betrayers and surely not just among people that you don't know and they don't know you even among loved ones let's continue rash and inflamed with self-conceit they will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements rather than lovers of god Has anybody noticed any of these things around us nowadays? Is this around the world? Among the people that yet do not know God? What about among the people, so-called believers? Who is the Lord talking about in this scripture? Well, two kinds. The people of the world and those that call themselves believers. And what does the Lord say in the scripture, in the scriptures of such as those so-called believers? Or call themselves believers. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 is quite clear. It says this. For although they hold the form of piety to religion, they deny and reject and are estranged to the power thereof. Their conduct belies the genuineness of their profession. Avoid all such people. Turn away from them. Wow. That's strong words. But what is really God saying through this scripture? If we consider the Gospels and the life of Christ Jesus upon the earth and the way he treated those that hated him and persecuted him and crucified him, when in the cross he says, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Who was he talking about? The Romans? The priests? Or maybe those that were yet to come to Christ through the testimony of the apostles? That's for you to investigate from the Lord. But I hear, I hear a wise, godly counsel that says, Love your enemies. How can we love them? Be kind. Help them if need be. Pray for them and their salvation without judging them. But avoid, avoid being under their influence. To me, in a nutshell, is talking about those who 
having a form of religion that deny their power of that profession of Christ by their conduct. So we don't want that influence in our life. So it will not happen to us as taking it normal, what is abnormal. Now, among those in the world that God was speaking in previous scriptures, the word of God says this in 2 Timothy 3, verse 8 to 9. Now, just as James and James were, and forgive me if I uh, pronounce it wrongly, they were hostile and resistant to Moses. So these men also are hostile to and oppose the truth. Talking about their people that the word of God described. They have depraved and distorted minds. Listen to that. And are reprobates and counterfeit and to be rejected as far as the faith is concerned. But they will not get very far for they arise fully will become obvious to everybody. No matter what the world does that is evil and wicked, God will make sure it is exposed. As was that of the magicians mentioned in this scripture, which is James and Jambres. So the world will not get away with what they believe now getting away with. And in verse 13 of 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, But wicked men and impostors, impostors, will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and leading astray others. Mm -hmm. Is that happening today? And being deceived and led astray themselves. So the deceivers I deceived themselves by the devil, by the darkness they chose to walk under. It is a clear picture to discern, isn't it? And in verse 12, it says, Indeed, all who delight in righteousness, in piety, and are determined to live a devoted and godly life in Christ Jesus will meet, meet what? Persecution. Will be made to suffer because of their religious tales. And this is the test for the believers. Am I willing to die for you, Lord? Well, Beloved, the word of God says, if we are caught in temptation, God provides in his great love a door of escape. So God has given us his Holy Spirit. And the Lord Holy Spirit will lead us to fulfill our destiny of becoming true sons of God. No longer little children tossed to and fro. The Lord is calling his people to stop fighting to have control of our lives. Why do we get exhausted? Why are we are frustrated? Because we are striving with the Lord, whether we know it or not, to have control. This has to be this way. That has to be this way. Lord, you have to do it such and such. Lord, show us this way. God is saying, be still and know that I am God. It is time, dear saints, to hand over the control of our lives, of our husbands, of our wives, of our children, grandchildren, of our workmates, of our brothers and sisters. 
hand over the control to the living God. And see for yourself the wonders he can do for you. For as long as we seek to control our life, our safety, our comfort, our pleasures. Dear beloved, we are bound to these demands and to the flesh. It is not of the spirit, it is of the flesh. The Lord wants us to receive his peace and to let him truly decide for us. For the things that come from above are better. Doesn't the word of God say every good and perfect gift comes from above? Doesn't the word of God, doesn't the Lord tell us that he will provide all things according to his riches in glory? Doesn't he say, I will never abandon you, I will never forsake you? There's nothing wrong with God. So we will check, we should check our faith and see if there is something wrong with it. Because the Lord says in John chapter 14, verse 17, this, Peace I live with you. Mm -hmm. So we should not be striving, right? My own peace I now give and bequeath to you. So not only we can have some form of peace as we desire, but the, the best and the greatest peace is God's peace. God's peace. So pass us all understanding. That is the peace we want. It is not a peace as the world gives. The one that he gives us. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and settled. For God is with us. And God loves us so passionately. And finally, in John 12, verse 26 to 28, the Lord says, if anyone serves me, he must continue to follow me, to cleave steadfast to me. Conform wholly to my example in living. <laughs> and if need be, in dying. And wherever I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, Dear beloved saints, at times, in these perilous times, we may find ourselves saying what Jesus spoke in verse 27. He says, now my soul is troubled and distressed. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour of trial and agony. But it was for this very purpose that I, get, I have come to this hour that I may undergo it. So then, beloved, we should join the Lord Jesus in what he says in verse 28. Lord, rather I will say, Father, glorify, honor and exalt your own name. Then, precious ones, for all you know, we might hear the heavenly Father say to us, I have already glorified it and I will glorify it again. You know, finally, Jesus Christ, in obedience to love, he denied himself for our sake. So the vital part of our final preparation of the heart is being so close to Jesus at his feet. 
by Mary, welcoming his word, treasuring it in our hearts, loving them so we can put them to practice, and therefore love. His love be completed in us. For without his love, we will not be able to love a neighbor, let alone our enemies. Ephesians 3, verse 19 to 21, speaks of that love. And he says that you may really come to know practically and experientially for yourself the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. And that you may be filled through all your being unto the fullness of God, the richest measure of the divine presence of God, and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. Now, unto him, in consequence of his action, of his power, that is at work within us, is able to carry out his purpose and superabundantly far over and above all that we dare to ask or think beyond our highest prayers and our desires, our thoughts and our hopes and our dreams. To him be the glory in the church, be the glory in your life, in my life and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and forever. Let us all therefore say amen. And at this time, a short prayer. Whatever you are, if you can, bow down and let the Lord touch your heart. Talk to him. Father, look at your people. Your Holy Spirit has touched many hearts. And today there is no veil that is covering, for your word has broken the veil. And now they are before you kneeling, some crying, asking, Lord, for forgiveness, for despair and for mistrust, for unpreparedness, from neglect. Lord, you are the God Almighty who has made the heaven and earth by your power, who is great and mighty, yet compassionate with all that you have made. Have mercy. Stretch forth your loving hand and embrace them with your beautiful love and heart. Let them know how important they are to you, how loved they are by you, in spite of whatever. And cleanse them, purify them, sanctify them by your precious blood and teach them by your spirit the pathways of the righteous heart. In Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. Until we meet again, beloved, you be very blessed. Next time, we shall talk about other preparations that the believers can go through to meet the Lord and meet the end times. In Jesus' name, Amen.